first car I stole was a Chevy Celebrity. But I liked it because the fuel injection was a little bit more than most. It was a little bit quicker than a lot of other cars on the road. I felt like I was flying. I thought I could outrun the police. You know, I felt empowered. I was last home in March of 1993. I had made parole after doing a two-year sentence for uh, stealing, stealing cars. So I'm in prison now for violating parole. I stole a lawnmower. And then while back in custody, I, I tried to escape about two to three times. So I've um, snowballed myself into 12 years since altogether. I had a habit of um, getting in fights. Know, they call it aggravated assault. So this is not all of them, but I did about at least five years in the hole. I've been medicated in the past. I've taken everything from Thorazine to Adirax and anything, Cinequan. And every jail I go to, they would diagnose me with being either bipolar or personality disorder. Whatever they would tell me, every jail I go to, it was different. So finally I came here at Greater Ford and I told them I'm not taking any more medication. So this is John uh, Caputo and uh, he's got a little bit better, about a year and uh, three months to go before he will max out on this present sentence. Oh, he already have a chance of parole, but he, d he don't want to go on parole. He decided at the last minute uh, not to proceed. It's taken me 11 years to, to, to become the type of prisoner that I am, where I walk around and I get a little bit of respect. When I first went to Huntington, I was 18, I was scared. It was a maximum security prison, and uh, everybody told me, when you go up to the upstate, don't accept no food or candy off anybody, and had this little Vietnamese guy coming up to my cell trying to give me a bag of Jolly Ranchers and a box of cakes. I thought he had other intentions. In time, I learned that he had found out I was the only Vietnamese guy that was ever in the prison with him. Here in prison, it seems like everybody is a minority. Lee, he was a big inspiration to me. I don't think he considered himself an artist, but the things that he would make or create in his cell, the ships he would build, it was just amazing. I tried to do what he did, and it turned out mine came out a lot better. He made me mobile, rock and chair. He made me boat. He sent home for me a lot of stuff. I started to force myself to be a little more creative. I was fascinated by making things that move. The salt was wonderful. A view of what his thoughts were in prison and his feelings of confinement. I called the prison. I was told that they don't have access to any woodworking tools. These men will be resourceful to finalize their goal. Do I have to take my shoes off? No, no, no. These are my pencil sharpeners. I take the blade out and use them on the wood. It's not a very secure. If they really wanted to find it, they find it. But my woodworking is consists of this box right here. And that's what I make all my stuff in. I use Q-tips a lot. I really like these. I get them from the nurse. We're only allowed to buy 10 pencils at a time. I figure I needed three, 400 pencils to make a big dollhouse. It takes a long time. The window stays open all night long when I shut that. This, this is my double lid, just in case any cool air does come in. It's usually louder than this. Guys screaming all the time, especially during block out or showers or yard. So. Artists on the outside are those who have the ambition and the creativity to sit down and take their time with their art, whatever medium it may be. I don't consider myself an artist. I I may, I may be a prison artist, but the only thing, qualifications for being a prison artist is you have to be a prisoner. I have seen men understand themselves better as a result of their art, become less violent, more involved in honing their craft than being a troublemaker. Once they get involved in the positive aspects of what we have to offer within the institutional walls. We have no problems with them.
I'm very thankful uh, to the warden for uh, permitting this type of activity uh, for John and for the other prisoners. And it seems to uh, take a lot of the time and attention and they're able to focus it into something uh, that's good. I try to solder some wire to um, little screws where I can try to tune it. It just gives me satisfaction to make something that, that works. And it's probably the only one in the prison. And you can see how many orders I got. Oh. So a guard wants a miniature grandfather clock and another guard wants a jewelry box. Yeah, I've been curating shows from Greaterford Prison because I feel that the public needs to be aware of the creativity that is in prison. We got to meet the prisoners and found that they were just really excited about their work and it seemed that a lot of them wanted to find out what to do to improve the art. He had thought through every single detail in his cell and had reconstructed it into this little miniature version. And you lift off the lid and there was actually a light that can be turned off and on for the cell itself. So they were really found objects that he made a very intricate, fine sculpture with. Pretty much everything I've done in prison, I've done what they wanted me to do with her. And say they said take stress and anger programs. I took them like four times. But to get a vocation, I'm getting a vocation. I took college courses. I've acquired my GED. I've done everything they wanted me to do, except for show up at the pro board. He's going to be 30 years old until uh, November, and he's been in jail since he's 17. He really hasn't committed a, a really serious crime. He was eligible for parole in 2000. Um, he could, at this point, at any time, apply for parole and be considered for parole. I've been in prison so long that I've lost the motivation even to try to go home. And they call that being institutionalized. When I, yeah. Excuse me. And here, uh, you see a lot of that. And uh, like someone in here will be like there'll be a barber or a, a prison artist or if I get leased to me I'm starting off from scratch I'll be nothing so that's, that scares me so it, it scares me so to deal with that, I just refuse to go see the parole board. When I worked in Bingwa Air Force Bay, that's how we met. He just stationed there. And when we met, and he liked me, then every day he go to the uh, car, um, uh, Anshil Club, they call, and he eat lunch, and he bring home for me five chicken. Then next day, he gave me chicken again, and I asked him if he would bring more fried chicken for me. But he asked me that I eat it, and I say yeah, but he don't know I bring home to share with my family. <laughs> when I give birth to John, I bought 23 or 24 around there. And I come here. Of course, I make my family, I make my country. I don't even understand English. As a child, he had some hearing problems and speech problems, and we got uh, speech therapy for several years. He would have outbursts, uh, striking or hitting others, to the point where the school uh, had difficulty uh, dealing with him. My tolerance for not obeying rules and laws was perhaps less than most people. I had four years of active duty, three tours in Vietnam, I stayed in the reserves. I was a security police NCO. Approximately my last 10 years, I was superintendent of a Air Force Reserve Security Forces Squadron. I've had psychologists tell me that growing up with a father that been through Vietnam War and has had an effect on me as a child growing up. I'm very anxious, 
I'm very jumpy. I have a lot of the signs and symptoms of somebody with post, uh, excuse me, post-traumatic stress disorder. When a, a female under his command complained of, to him of sexual harassment from the major, my, my father turned him in and got the major pretty much kicked off the, block, on the, on the base. The organization ostracized me, retaliated. He had, uh, I believe, death, death uh, threats. It affected me emotionally. That's what started my post-traumatic stress. It pains me to see my father like that because my father has always been the strength of my life. Somebody must have made that by hand. Wow. I got about two hours sleep in the last two and a half, three days. And I can't sleep here. So I've been sleeping on the couch or um, not sleeping at all. But it's a, you know, my new cell. They accumulated a whole lot since I was in prison. They have too many TVs, too many stereos. They have too much of everything in here. That's how I wanted her to have when I sent them home. I wanted her to put them up on the shelf. 70 flowers I cut out by hand. Every flower has 16 petals. I, I made these little treasure chests for my mom and then I got a little better and I started putting little handles on it. And then I improved a little bit more. This is carved out of a bar of uh, safeguard. And I used straw, I got a broom thread I got out of a um, towel. I made a bunch of them. I made it out of pencils and Q-tips and one popsicle stick and a, and a rubber band. Then I made this truck tailgate opens, closes, little engine inside. Hmm. Then I made the motorcycle. I put my max state 52903 on there, which is about nine and a half months from now. Hopefully I can do them on the street. It's hard, especially doing a lot of time. I'm used to being in the cell by myself uh, 24 hours a day, and now I have people living with me. I'm sharing a bathroom. You know, I came out to a different world. Everybody out here has a cell phone. Even 13-year-old kids are running around with cell phones. Everything has a remote control around the house. I haven't even figured out how to use it yet. I don't even know how to use a phone. You have to dial the area code before you can dial the number. I still haven't even figured out the faucet. I went to play video games the other day. and Every video game worked off of a credit card. Even the clothes I'm wearing, I don't even know if I'm dressing right. I learned how to get online. There's a lot of pornography out there. I find myself staring a lot. I've got a couple of responses so far. What are you looking at? I find my, myself ready to like smack her or smack him. And, and i got to like tell myself, whoa, relax, let's walk away. Prisoners actually treat each other with a, a lot of respect. If you accidentally bump into somebody, you say, excuse me, or I'm sorry, you know. I got out the other day and uh, just jumped on a bus. It felt good to just walk through the courthouse without handcuffs and shackles and guards around you. When I left the prison, I thought, I'd get a job in the same week. But it's hard enough like, making this transition and my emotions are it's on a ro roller coaster. It's up and down, up and down. And I can see why people are, are going right back. I haven't seen so many women in so long that I like everyone I see. I find it hard to even approach them. And then they woke me up. I had to get an attorney. She came to court and said she wanted to drop the charges. But the, the court said, well, we'll just postpone it for six months and see what happens. I've been avoiding problems, doing the right thing. Good morning, Joe. How you doing? So you guys are getting along pretty well? Well, yeah, we're getting along good. Somebody wants to fight me or something. 
most of the times I try to walk away from it, you know, unless I can. I got into an altercation uh, about, about a week ago. The guy pulled a gun out on me, and so I, I waited on him and waited on him until I caught him another time, and I, I punched him in his face, you know, because I knew he didn't have the pistol on him then. About a week or so later, I, I drove up, and him and about six of his friends were waiting on me, so I had two pairs of brass knuckles in my hands. And then by that time, the police were called, and I was able to get rid of all that stuff. And they've seen I've, I've changed, and I work all the time. So this East Lint Mall, it's just nothing left anymore. A lot of crime around here. They built a Walmart about a half a mile away, so everybody moved out of the mall. And the shop isn't doing too well, but we're talking about uh, m maybe moving it. My boss wants to sell me the shop. I may do that. He, he's even willing to take the payments. But I haven't really taken any time for artwork. I don't have any time anymore for that. Now that I found a nighttime job, I make a lot more money. I think it calmed me down, and that's what I needed. I've been working close to 100 hours a week. So I finally paid off the barber shop, and, and then I signed the lease for the new location next to a bar. We'll call for the inspection. Once that gets approved, we'll put out all the, the final touches on. Move it See, now. I was talking about, you're going to be okay if you come right to here. I was able to find this painter to do the uh, artwork on the windows. My mother is reupholstering all the furniture and the waiting room chairs and the barber chairs. My family and I are getting along fantastic. It makes me feel so good just to sit around with them. And I think that's made a, a big difference in my life. Gabe became almost like a grandfather to me. He helps me out with the shop, shows me how to run a business, teaching me about the taxes. John's been a good boy, he's been working hard, and he's really good at achieving a lot. You see this, now you got it on record. Yeah, I got it on record. you're a good guy. Yeah. <laughs> Call me a good boy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Did I say boy? I yeah, that's even better. <laughs> I'm waiting for my buddy to come in here from Harrisburg. He gets off parole August 15th, and he has the manager's license in barbering. He actually uh, helped teach me how to cut hair in the barber school. And I really don't trust anyone else, except for Gabe. And Gabe's 76 now. He doesn't want to work full time. Here I have an extra room in my apartment. He's going to move right in with me. I moved uh, directly next door to the barber shop. It's like 30 feet away. Uh, lately, I've been feeling pretty lonely. All the girls I want to be with, I don't want to be with me. And girls that do want to be with me, I don't want to be with them. So I'm not going to try to rush it. I believe that art sustained me in prison and it, and it gave me an avenue to achieve something with myself where you couldn't really achieve anything in there. A way to just express myself and bring attention to myself that wasn't bad. And um, it made me feel good about myself and it inspired me to try to do the best I could and whatever I do. He took a plastic bag and made a parachute and, a little, and he would throw it up in the air, up in the yard, and it would go up and then float down and he'd throw it back up. And you'd walk by the cell, he'd have mobiles and he makes like little origami spiders and they'd be crawling down the wall. And he's a flirt. He'd go up to the medical and then he'd hand a nurse some wheelchairs he'd make out of wood. We're roommates now. We work together in the barber shop all day, and then I work for the same company he does at night. And we go out, you know, have a good time. I mean, he's just, he's been a real friend. Me, I've never been good with money. Because honestly, I was locked up 17 out of 20 years. So I never learned financial responsibilities, this and that. So I'm learning that stuff through him. Since then, I've gotten a credit line of 20000 and I paid off my motorcycle and all my bills. But then I started using it and buying new TV, new furniture, new this, new that. Bought the truck. Yeah, this is the barbershop truck. Two haircuts in the Marine Base down the street. Special needs facilities, group homes, and the VIP haircuts out of the shop. I want to be the best barber. I want to have the best barbershop. I want to have a reputation for the barber shop and the barber mobile to be the best cuts around. I take pictures of uh, different haircuts. See how the hair line wraps around his head. Beard work. Uh, 
I'd say I have a 30% chance of going back to prison. Because when I got out, the chances were that I had a 30% chance of staying out. I'm really proud of him. He makes comments like, you know, when he was in prison, you know, he missed out on things we did. And I said, you know what, John? Our life wasn't like this when you were in prison. Like, we were sad, like there was a part of us missing. It wasn't like you were missing out on, the, on all this fun. This fun didn't happen until you came home. I've been seeing Shelly for a while now. She's dedicated to me. You know, we still fight all the time and argue and stuff, but she knows how I feel about it. I don't want any kids right now. I'm a kid. I'm confident, but I'm not overconfident because I've seen where people have provoked me and, and next thing I know, I'm in that situation. I was trying to maintain control and they threw a punch at me and then as soon as they did that, I snapped. I beat somebody up day after Christmas and I got out of the car with my bear spray, but I punched him right in his face and I just started kicking him in his face. I just kept beating him and beating him, beating him. And I, I started to tie him up with the Christmas lights but then I thought, you know, the police come here and they're going to find this guy knocked out, tied up with the Christmas lights. That's a little bit overkill. I don't want to be where I was at in 07. The, the older I get, I take less and less chances. I work hard. I play hard. I try not to do anything that will put me back into prison. It was probably the worst experience of my life, like a nightmare. I felt as though I was holding my breath like I was underwater. And the longer I was in there, like the less I can just, I can hold my breath any longer. So I'm gonna run with what I have. So it's just a, just a little barber shop, but it's brought me a lot of satisfaction, and it's made me feel good about myself. I hired a third barber. He also got his barber's license, like me and Roger have. I'm single. Well, that's not a bad thing. You know, I would like to have one person have a family and settle down. So that's probably my last goal that I'll probably be starting to work on. You can't break that revolving door in and out of prison. You know, you just got to make a plan, stick to it. You know, I don't have to take nobody else's things. I have my own stuff now. Now I have a Dodge Charger. It's an SRT, like an upgraded engine and everything else. I'm really proud of it. I love going up to the racetrack and racing it. But it's nice to um, be able to get along with the police department in general. So as long as I stay out of prison, that's all that matters to me. You know, if I die alone without ever finding anybody to be with, just as long as I never went back to prison, it'll be a success. I had a police officer come up here with the police car about two weeks ago. Wanted to know if, he, if I would race him in the police car. But I, I think he knew he didn't have a chance. I said, "We can if you want to." And I actually went up there two, three weeks ago. You and took your clothes off? No. no. And uh, I was uh, expecting my dad to have some shorts on for me, but he was strutting around. He was naked? Yeah, he's butt-ass butt naked. I'm happy for him. I don't care. <laughs>